Well, hello and welcome everyone to another session in the Solid Finances series. I'm glad you all could join us today. Before we get started, just wanted to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping notes here. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Montana State University Extension, University of Idaho Extension, North Dakota State University Extension Service, and South Dakota State University Extension. Uh, those four organizations have come together to uh, put this on for you with some financial support from the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. And some of you today are also watching from a uh, local hosted site, and if you're at one of those sites, uh, please take a moment to thank your host uh, for making that available um, to you and your community. A couple things I want to um, remind you of, um, our website, msuextension.org uh, forward slash solid finances, that's where we keep um, all of our recordings um, of the sessions from last week, from the previous week, and going back a couple years. There's probably about 35 recordings there, so if you ever want to uh, review one, share one that you saw with someone else, um, or just catch one that you missed, um, that's the place to do that. We do keep the uh, handouts archived there as well. Also, the upcoming uh, schedule. Is also there, and then, um, and I know several of you have already done this, um, have obtained contact information for myself or for some of our other uh, presenters, and uh, sent us an email between sessions and uh, a couple questions. A couple had a suggestion for a, a future session, so we do like to hear from you. So um, that's one way you can find our contact information and uh, tell us what you're thinking there too. So just a reminder that that's there to you. Um, always. And we generally post our recordings um, Friday morning, so today's session will be available about 48 hours or so after the live session takes place. Gives us a chance to edit it and get our website updated and then we move that over there. And then uh, today during the session I just want to note a couple tools you've got that you can communicate with us. At the bottom of the screen is our question and answer uh, pod. Um, feel free to type in a question. Only the hosts will see that and we won't read your name uh, on the air. We'll just say we had a question come in and uh, you know, then we'll go ahead and try to address that. So don't, uh, don't feel like um, your name is going to get spread out everywhere if you, if you do that. So go ahead and send in questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you along the way. And then we're going to ask a few poll questions today to see a little bit about uh, what you know or what situation you're in. Um, and so feel free to vote on those. And again, it's anonymous how each person votes. Uh, all we'll see is the group um, results of those polls. So um, please do make a point to participate in those today as we go along. Just a reminder about the remaining sessions um, for this year. Uh, today's session um, kind of marks the end of the two sessions we had kind of related to kids and money. Um, and our, uh, our next block will be related to health and finances and those will start after Thanksgiving on November 30th. Um, and we'll have Nancy Porter uh, talking to us about Small Steps to Health and Wealth and how that program works. And then we'll have uh, Carrie Johnson on December 7th talking about health insurance options for those nearing retirement. And then finally, December 14th, um, we'll talk about healthcare savings accounts and flexible spending accounts. And then we will uh, take a break until after the new year. Um, so please mark your calendar for those. But do note also that there is a couple week gap between now and when we will be back um, on the air there as well. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Carrie Johnson. This is the first time Carrie's presented this year, but uh, many of you have probably uh, heard Carrie present in past years. She happens to be um, an expert in uh, student loans and federal financial aid. So um, today, Carrie Johnson is going to tell us about some of the recent changes um, to that federal financial aid. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carrie. All right. Thanks, Joel. Um, as Joel said, so today I'm going to talk about some recent changes in federal financial aid. What I'm really focusing on today is more of how things are going to affect consumers. So the behind the scenes changes, um, maybe some, a few changes to the FAFSA, so some different questions I probably won't address specifically, um, but things that are really going to affect those who need to, um, who need to obtain federal financial aid or who have already taken out student loans. So that's kind of how um, I'm going to look at this today and how what I'm going to focus on. Um, and there is a lot of information in here and I'm going to go over a few very big changes. So as I go through, if I go too fast or if you have questions as we go, please do feel free to ask um, in the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. So. First and foremost, I wanted to talk about the changes to those who have to fill out the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. So um, those of you who have never done this before or who may have done this may remember that you do this every year and this is where grants 
any federal grants come from, and any federal student loans come from. And typically, you would wait until after you completed your tax return and use the most recent tax return for the upcoming school year. So starting with the 2017-2018 school year, which is um, next fall, the FAFSA is going to use the prior prior year. So what that means is um, instead of having to wait until January, February, March until you have completed your taxes, you can actually use 2015 tax return for the upcoming year. So instead of the FAFSA actually opening on October 1st or on January 1st as it has in the past, it, will actu it actually has already opened um, and that happened on October 1st. So it has been open for a while. And this just kind of helps out those students. So in the past, if you didn't have your taxes done right away, you had to wait. Or uh, a lot of students would guess what their income would be or use the previous year's tax return information. And it would be incorrect, so they would have to go on and make changes. So hopefully this will help alleviate some of those issues that students um, and parents may have with having to wait until taxes are done. So just this is basically this screen is basically just what I said kind of in in picture format. Unfortunately with this presentation I was having a really hard time finding a lot of a lot of pictures so this might be the last picture you see um, in this whole presentation. Um, but again so as you can see for last year's FAFSA the 2016-2017 so the year we're in now uh, these families use the 2015 tax return. So next year, it will just be the same exact tax return that families used the previous year to, to complete that FAFSA. Okay? So then going into the 2018-2019 school year is uh, when they will begin to use the 2016 data. Okay, so I just wanted to ask a quick poll um, and ask you, do you think all income-driven repayment plans are the same? So as you can see, we're kind of going from the FAFSA itself because that's kind of the big change there. And now we'll start talking about some different repayment plans and, and things that affect some borrowers. Okay. So it looks like we've got most everybody answer. Um, so false, 81.8% say that the answer is false. So that is correct. Um, all of the income driven repayment plans are not the same. And I'm going to go over two of them that have come out in the last five years. So this says recent changes and I kind of went back about five years to see, okay, what are these big changes? So if parents don't have students in school right now, um, we'll kind of give you an update on some of these newer repayment plans. So right now there are two, four, six um, different income driven repayment plans. So some of the older ones we have the income contingent, uh, income sensitive, and the income sensitive uh, has, it's probably kind of going away, um, away because that is only for those who have borrowed uh, under the FEEL loan program, the Family Financial Education Loan Program, which no longer exists. Everything has switched over to the direct loan program. Um, so that one will probably be uh, gone eventually. There's the income-based repayment plan. And then uh, there's also income-based repayment plan for those who borrow borrowed um, student loans after July 1st, 2014. So it's the same plan, but there's a few different benefits for those individuals who graduated or who borrowed after 2014. Uh, the two that I'm going to talk about today are the pay as you earn and the revised pay as you earn. Those are the two newest plans that are out there. And again, these are repayment plans. So this is after students have taken out their student loans, they've graduated or left school, they're no longer attending at least half time, they get to choose which repayment plan they want to use. They can still use the standard or the graduated or the extended, you know, kind of those um, repayment plans that we may think of are more of those traditional repayment plans that we may have um, paid our student loans back. These uh, newer re income driven repayment plans are just for those students who say, you know, I can't really afford that monthly payment. Let's lower it for now. Um, so the pay as you earn. 
this is kind of, again, it gets tricky. It's always when did you take out your first loan and when did you have your last loan? So this repayment plan is only for those who, bar who were new borrowers after October 1st, 2007, and then they must have received a disbursement of a direct loan on or after 2011. So they couldn't have had any loans prior to 2007, but they had to have gotten some loans after 2011. So a lot of individuals who may have graduated with their undergraduate degree, gone back for a graduate program, they couldn't actually use this repayment plan because they had loans prior to 2007. And the big thing with this loan that that was a little or this repayment plan is that it was a little more appealing than the income based because the income based repayment plan uses 15% of discretionary income whereas the pay as you earn or the pay um, drop that down to 10% and what I mean when I say discretionary income that's the difference between your income and 150% of the poverty guidelines for your family size and the state you live in, you reside in. So <laughs> that 5% can make quite a bit of a difference and your payments could not exceed that. Um, any amount that you have not paid back after 20 years would be forgiven. However, um, that is taxed as income if it's forgiven. So. I have worked with clients that may have very low monthly payments or even no monthly payments. Well, if they get a $50,000 loan forgiven that year, they will have to claim that they had $50,000 in income. Uh, the other one nice, the other nice thing uh, with the pay as you earn repayment plan is that the government will continue to pay unpaid interest that accrues on any subsidized loans for the first three years um, in repayment. So that um, is really appealing for students. So again, let's look at those dates. So we've got, um, you couldn't have had any loans prior to 2007, but you have to have had loans after 2011. This took out a big chunk of students that could not use this repayment plan. Um, again, like I said, you, I, it really the most who were affected were probably graduate students, those who um, probably have higher student loan debt anyway, they could not benefit from this repayment plan. So they decided to expand it basically and come up with the revised pay as you earn plan. Now this repayment plan, very similar to the pay as you earn. However, it does not matter when the loan was dispersed or if you were a new borrower or not. So it really did expand that program to more, more students could use this. Now the um, forgiveness option on this one, you can see um, 20 years for undergraduate loans, so the same as the pay as you earn. However, if you had graduate student loans, you, had to make pay you have to make payments for, for 25 years, not 20 years. So that's a really big difference there. Also with the interest on this repayment plan, if the payment is under, um, if the payment under your revised pay as you earn repayment plan does not cover the, the accruing interest on your student debt, your total loan balance will grow. Um, so you're actually only going to be responsible for 50% of the interest accrued. So they are trying to trying to help with some of that negative amortization and trying to help these um, borrowers out so they're not just paying on interest but they can start chipping away at that principal as well. One major difference, so if you've never gone on and chosen a repay, an income driven repayment plan or if you're still in school or your students haven't or your children haven't graduated yet, you may not know that you have to actually give them your tax information from the previous year. Well, under this plan, it's a little different than the income-based. So on the income-based repayment plans, when you give your income information, if you and your spouse have filed separately, you do not need to use your spouse's, spouse's income as, as income. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll just give a quick example here. If you and your husband file taxes separately and have three children, your family size is still five. 
you still count that you and your that your husband or wife or your spouse is in your household. However, if you have filed married your filed your taxes, married filing separately, your your spouse's income does not count towards that 10% of of discretionary income. However, under this revised pay as you earn, even if you and your spouse file taxes separately, you have to use your spouse's um, income to calculate your payment. So yes, the income-based repayment is 15% of discretionary income, so that does sound like more than 10%, but if you're filing taxes separately, so you, your student loans are lower, so if your spouse is making quite a bit more money than you, that may make a major difference. So the student aid or studentloans.gov website has wonderful calculators and you can put you can work work it both ways. So just as an FYI, but remember if you file taxes separately, you're losing out on some um, deductions and some credits that you can get as well and your standard deduction is lower. Okay, so our next poll is the Department of Education services all direct loans. What do you think? And Carrie, we had a question come in. Um, oh, yeah. What are some places you can go for additional information about um, the FAFSA? Uh, the FAFSA.gov website is wonderful. Uh, they have a lot of information. Uh, be careful and make sure you're on the FAFSA.gov website. Now on the Solid Finances website, I have a link to it um, on our resources page. So you can get that, and I'll actually be referring to quite a bit of those resources throughout the presentation. Thank you for that question that came in, so that way I could remind myself <laughs> that that's where I got all of this information that you're that you're hearing today. Okay, so only a few of you think it's true, and the answer is false. Um, Department of Education does not service all of the direct student loans. They used to, they no longer do. Um, so we'll go through some of the servicer changes. So if you've had loans at least 15 years ago, you may have been at a school where you could choose the lender. Um, so you may have chose, oh, I'm going to use US Bank, or I'm going to use Wells Fargo because their fees are lower to take out my, and at that time, Stafford loans. Um, however, all of the, that loan program has been sunsetted and all of um, the student loans are now direct student loans if you're getting a federal loan. And for a while they were servicing all of their loans. However, it, I, I understand it probably got to be a lot. Um, so they started hiring some servicers. <laughs> so. Some of the changes that have come out, the Student Aid Bill of Rights from 2015 says that the Department of Education will no longer give preference to four student loan servicers. Okay? Uh, currently there are 11 servicers that um, service federal student loans. The other change uh, that came about said that servicers are now allowed, so if you have debt, they can actually use robocall technology to auto dial you if you've missed payment. So um, that was something that was not that they that debt collectors for student loans were not able to do in the past. Now, some upcoming changes, changes that have not taken effect yet at this point in time, um, changing to a single student loan servicing um, entity. We'll go through these. Now, when I was doing the research on this and actually looking at this, there is no date. No date has come out saying when this will take effect. Um, so just remember that all of these things can change in the blink of an eye with different legislation going through and, and things like that. So these are the, the rules right now. <coughs> so. Once there is a single servicer, I'm going to kind of give you what the idea is behind it. A single web portal for all federally held loans and a standard communication format branded with the Department of Education logo. So borrowers will no longer need to know the name of their servicer to manage their student loans, which is kind of nice. So cut down on some of that confusion. Um, standard customer service practices will ensure a consistent customer experience. So they want 
all borrowers to have the same experience um, and not 11 different experiences depending on the training or the company that um, they are have their loan service through. There uh, will be more oversight, accountability, and transparency for all student loan service providers and greater incentive for providers to keep borrowers current on their payments and assist those at high risk for delinquency and default. Specially trained personnel will assist high risk borrowers and those in the military. So giving um, you know, those lower income people, individuals in the military, maybe somebody who's on vocational re re rehabilitation, give them a little bit more assistance and hopefully they don't go into default. Some proactive communication to ensure borrowers on income driven plans are aware when it is time to recertify their plan. So we talked about the two um, income driven repayment plans and I kind of gave you a list of the others. The thing with those is every year, so annually, individuals have to certify what they make. So payments, monthly payment amounts do change monthly, um, annually, sorry. Um, increased call center hours, so account access and payment methods, including the use of mobile technology. Uh, so, and then I have on here consistent payment application. And what that means is some servicers may apply any extra payments to, to different areas. So this will make sure that larger payments than that amount that is due are submitted without instructions will have the excess applied in a way that saves the borrower the most money. Uh, borrowers will also be able to go online and provide instructions on how to allocate those extra payments. So if they want it to go to a late payment or if they want it to go to interest or they want it to go to the principal, they will be able to um, tell that. And then payments that are actually less than the amount that is due will be applied in a way that keeps the most loans current. So every year you t students take out a different, a new loan. Um, so it's trying to keep that at a minimum. So if they have taken out four loans, let's say, and they pay $100, but their payment's $150, they're going to apply it to as many loans as possible. So they're, the students, um, the borrower, because they're no longer students if they're repaying, um, so the borrower um, does not have as many late fees. So they don't give them four late fees, they may only get one. So some e increased access to detailed account information, so some, some better websites. Uh, servicers will develop a, a comprehensive complaint resolution plan that dovetails with the department's own recently launched feedback system. So borrowers should expect to have their complaint acknowledged within 15 days and a resolution within 60. And I have a question that came in. I'll finish this slide and then I will address that. Uh, the department will receive all complaint information and the Federal Trade Com uh, Commission's consumer system will take care of those. Um, the system is accessible by uh, like Department of Veterans Affairs and Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and Department of Defense. So everybody will be able to see those. The department will publicize data. So that's kind of nice uh, currently. Each servicer does that. Um, and then while many servicers already do offer this level of service, so all of these things I've talked about, most of the lend or a lot of the servicers and maybe all you know all of them say that they do these, um, but not all borrowers have had this experience. So the Department of Education's goal really is to increase consistency, accuracy, accountability, and transparency through the whole federal student loan system. And the question that came in said, how do the borrowers set up auto payment services with the single servicer model? That, again, like I said, <laughs> this has not, this was just a bill that was written. It has not taken effect. So at this point in time, I'm not sure. I'm assuming there will be just a, a website that they would go to and be able to do that. Um, from what I have read and what I've, I've heard, that is kind of how it's going to be. So instead of, let's say, my loan is through Great Lakes, my brother's loan is through Nelnet, and my cousin's loan, let's say, is through Fed Loan Servicing, we would all have three different ways to make payments, set up auto payments, um, 
and then all three of those companies have their own way of, of doing customer service, their own way of applying payments to loans and that type of thing. Under this, there would be one web portal and one way to do it. So again, a little more consistent, uh, which, which is kind of nice for those of us who uh, work with clients or help our family members out in doing these things. So I help um, a family member do their annual recertification of income and it's like, oh wait, you have a different servicer, so what does your website look like compared to what my website looks like and we kind of have to hunt around. But um, how does a borrower consolidate their federal student loans for the single payment option? Consolidation will not change. Currently, um, students go to the uh, studentloans.gov and consolidate their loans there. That will not change. This is just after, if they do consolidate or if they don't, this is just how um, the servicers handle payments, basically. So the consolidation will not change. You'll still need your FSA ID, which was a change last year. So um, if you had a PIN number that is no longer valid, it, the FSA ID is for a little bit better security and it, uh, it's basically a username and a, and a password versus having to put in social security number, first two letters of last name, date of birth, and a PIN number. Okay. So yes, kind of listen and see what comes down and see how this will shape out, you know, how this comes out and how, how it will look. Um, but I'm assuming it, it'll be a link from one of the Department of Education's federal student aid pages, so. <laughs> Perkins loan changes. So this, these changes have kind of been fluid over the last several months. Um, for a while, they were saying, okay, Perkins loans, we're doing away with them. We're going to phase them out. They're done. Um, how, and it did expire in the fall of 2015. However, it just received a two-year extension through September 2017. Uh, so again, <laughs> what we thought we knew, this program is ending. We'll, we'll focus more on the direct loans. Now they're saying this program is not ending at least until 2017. So. Um, just to keep in mind that the Perkins loan is still out there, but um, may look a little different in the future as well. Recently renewed uh, with tougher eligibility requirements. And they're telling schools that we do not, um, do not award a student or pay out a student a Perkins loan unless they have exhausted all of their direct loans first. That includes unsubsidized. So, um, if you didn't know, subsidized direct loans have zero interest while in school and then a fixed interest rate after graduation or dropping below half time. With uh, unsubsidized loans, the, the borrower is responsible for interest while they're in school. Now on a Perkins loan, again, that is a subsidized loan where no interest is paid while in school and then a 5% fixed interest rate upon graduation or leaving dropping below half time. So they want students to take out interest-bearing loans before they're able to take out a Perkins loan. So again, just kind of making it a little stricter and a little, a little more difficult to obtain those loans. And maybe, again, maybe in September of 2017, the point will be moot because they will not be making any new Perkins loan. Um, or maybe they, they will continue and they will um, extend this even farther. So. Again, wait and see what happens with this loan. All right, our next poll. What is the maximum amount a graduate student can borrow in a year? So we're going to go from some servicing changes, now we're, and then we talked a little bit about the Perkins Loan Program, and now we'll talk about some, some changes to graduate, um, to student loans for graduate students. Okay, we've kind of got a mixed um, amount here, which a lot of us wouldn't know uh, what this is anyway. But for a graduate student, they can take $20,500 a year for their federal student loans, for direct loans. Um, 
So that's per year. The aggregate limit is $138,500. And this aggregate limit includes their undergraduate loans. So um, they cannot take more than that in direct loans. Again, there are a few, a few um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, exceptions to that rule, depending if you're a health professional. So if you're in medical school, pharmacy school, um, law school, some of those types of professions do allow for a larger limit. But just a, uh, for a student going to get a master's or a PhD or something like that, typically this is what they're going to see as their cumulative limit. The big change with student with graduate students. So when I went to graduate school, I could take up to eight thousand five hundred dollars in subsidized student loans every year, and then the rest would be unsubsidized, twelve thousand in unsubsidized. However, that has changed, and graduate students are no longer eligible to receive subsidized loans. So the entire twenty thousand five hundred dollars, if they choose to take the full amount, you know, not every graduate student takes out the maximum allowed, um, but some do. Uh, some don't want to work. Some just decide that this is what they need to do to get through graduate school. Um, so they have interest-bearing loans the whole time they're in school. Uh, just a quick change for funding for low-income families. And these kind of change annually or they kind of look at these every once in a while, these, these um, automatic zero numbers. So parents of a dependent student, if the parents make $25,000 or less, they automatically get a zero expected family contribution. And what that means is that they are eligible for the highest amount of, per, of Pell Grant. Um, and I'm not even sure what the, um, what the numbers are for next year. I haven't looked what the maximum Pell Grant is. but been around six thousand less it's been less than six thousand but kind of around that amount um, so they automatically qualify for that that um, and then if you're an independent student so you're attending graduate school or you have a bachelor's degree or uh, you're married or have a child your amount is twenty five thousand or left less and if you're married that includes your spouse's income So public service loan forgiveness, um, some of you may have heard of this, some of you may have not. Uh, it's been in the news a lot the last few years. It's kind of a, a big kind of a push this year. Well, 2017 actually will be the first year that, that anyone can actually use this. Uh, this was um, brought about in October of 2007. So this is where if you're working for a local, um, state, federal, nonprofit, or I'm sorry, federal, state, local government, or a nonprofit, you would qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And what that means is instead of paying 20 or 25 years of student loans before they're forgiven, you have to make 120 on-time payments. So that is 10 years. So after 10 years, the amount of federal, direct federal loans that you have is forgiven. Um, and the one nice bonus with this, being in public service, that amount that is forgiven is not counted as taxable income. So again, nobody has yet to qualify for this because this came about in 2007. So 2017 will be the first year that anybody would be able to claim um, public service loan forgiveness. And Department of Education has come out with the forms. They also have forms so if um, you leave one position and go to another, uh, you have your human resources office complete that form saying, yes, this person worked here full time. And those payments that you make, those on-time payments, and what they mean by on-time, they have to have been made within 15 days of your due date, um, so within your grace period. You have to have been employed full time at one of these qualifying um, places. So that's really important to remember. So if you work for federal government for five years, leave for two years, and go back for three, that doesn't count. Um, so if you decide to go back, go into the private sector for three years, you're adding three years onto your um, forgiveness option. 
So I know this is really confusing. A lot to kind of kind of take in on this one. Um, but we'll see kind of how it works. Hopefully next year uh, some individuals will have made those 120 on-time payments and we can see um, if that's getting forgiven the way it was kind of worked out to be forgiven. And last year they were really trying to push having a cap on the amount forgiven into the, I think it was 57000 or something like that, but that did not go through. So if a, if a borrower has $100,000 in student loans and they've been making payments of $5 a month for 10 years because they're on an income-based repayments plan, the, they can get the full $100,000 forgiven after 10 years. Um, this one, Program Integrity and Improvement. This is uh, borrowers are able to choose how they want to receive their refunds. It really has a lot to do with those students who are still in school who receive a financial aid reimbursement check. Um, so um, how federal financial aid, how most schools do it is they uh, say, okay, you owe $2,000 in tuition fees, room and board, you're getting a $3,000 financial aid check, you get $1,000 back because we have our money. So this is saying that the borrowers are able to choose how they receive their aid refund. Schools cannot tell them how they have to get it. Um, some schools had tried to make it so they, it was direct deposit. Um, if a student chooses to get a paper check, they can still get a paper check is what they're saying. Some students don't have a bank account. They don't want it to go into a bank account. So the school has to give them the option to receive the funds how they want to receive them. They also said that students must be given objective and neutral information about disbursement options. So they can't be persuade, persuasive um, about what, to, um, what disbursement options are available. Institutions must give borrowers the choice about how they receive their aid, and then they're prohibited from requiring certain accounts. And what I mean by this is institutions are prohibited from requiring students or parents to open certain accounts uh, into which their student aid refunds are deposited. They're required to ensure that students are not charged any excessive or confusing fees. So a school might pre, you know, say, hey, we'll give you this preloaded card. Um, and then the student goes to use it and then they're charged a fee to obtain their own money. If a student selects an account offered directly or indirectly by contractors that assist institutions in making direct payments, um, electronic payments made to a student's pre-existing account are required to be made in a timely manner. So if a uh, school says, you know, if you just use our account versus your hometown bank, they can't say, oh, it's going to take longer if you don't choose our, um, our, our bank. Okay? So they're really trying to crack down on students um, being kind of taken advantage of because uh, some schools may receive some incentives from banks or um, lenders or other, other companies to use their uh, product. All right, I believe this is the last one that I really wanted to touch on because this was something I didn't know about. It happened um, 2015, happened last year. That kind of shocked me. I found out about it when I went to purchase my home um, this summer in, uh, here in Fargo. Um, so borrowers who are on income-based repayment plans, if they choose to get an FHA or USDA loan, uh, loans are required to use 1% of your outstanding balance and not your actual payment. Now, I have an example after this, so this is a lot of words, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you the math. Um, and really, you think, oh, I'm not ever going to get an FHA loan, I'm not going to get a USDA loan. The thing is, a lot of lenders, a lot of banks say, you know, these are the FHA rules, we're going to use this across the board with all of our loan products. And that's kind of where I ran into it. Great. It didn't really affect me because my debt to income ratio was still fine. But if you think of somebody who's just graduating from school, um, has a high student loan debt, is not making a lot of money, but their student loan payments $50 a month because they're on income base, but they're thinking, okay, 
work that fifty dollars into my debt to income and I'm I'm fine, I'm good. The problem is if they owe fifty thousand dollars, the lender is not going to say, Oh, you're making a fifty dollar payment. They're going to look at it, you're making a five hundred dollar payment. So this is where um, it might get a little more difficult for student loan debtor, debtors to receive a mortgage. So again, just some quick some some math for you. So you owe seventy five thousand dollars in federal student loans. You're on an income driven repayment plan, and you pay two hundred dollars a month. But your lender is looking at that as um, you have a seven hundred and fifty dollar monthly payment on your student loan, not two hundred dollars. So I really wanted to um, really touch on this one, and the reason is. Uh, you don't think of maybe this type of thing when you're when you're um, going to purchase a home because you're looking at it going, oh, this is what this is what I pay. Um, so every bank I talk to, uh, they they use the FHA rules for our, for their loans. Um, but I found some people say, you know, we we found a bank online that that uses that you know we had a VA loan and they would let us you know use our actual payment but you'll have to do a little bit of digging on that as well now on our resources page for today there is a uh, fact sheet that was written by a colleague of mine from Purdue and it talks a lot about these different changes that have happened in the last in the in the last few years we said recent changes and again some of it has changed since we've even written that. Um, things kind of, with the student loans and federal financial aid, it, it's kind of fluid and we just kind of watch how it's going and, and really see, okay, what's, what's coming out this year, what's really going to affect consumers and, and are they going to make changes to that in the future, we don't know. So, um, But I wanted to leave it a little bit of time open here for questions and I know Joel has um, an evaluation for you all to take as well, a few questions. And, yeah, and, well, folks, and maybe I'll jump in while folks are thinking of questions. Um, I want to point out a couple things. Uh, Carrie also did two sessions on student loans last year. They were both in February, so um, one on student loan consolidation. I know we had some questions about that earlier. Um, that's up on our recorded um, listing there of sessions so if you want to go back and take a look at that that is um, great and then we also had um, another session about applying um, for federal financial student aid in the FAFSA um, also done in February of 2016 there's also a couple older ones on there as well but I'll point you to those two um, specifically and then um, well folks let me uh, switch over here um, while you're thinking of um, maybe a possible question or two if you'd give us a little bit of feedback on today's session, we would certainly appreciate it. And again, we won't share these results with um, anyone. These are anonymous. One uh, final point I want to make before I um, um, at least start with the first question back to uh, um, Carrie today is um, we will be sending a um, evaluation link out here in the next either this afternoon or first thing uh, tomorrow morning and it's going to be very short um, just a couple questions um, and this is your opportunity one to um, for us to measure how we're doing but two for um, you to give us some suggestions on things you like that we're doing um, things that you uh, wish that we wouldn't do, um, some ideas for improvement in the future. So um, please take maybe uh, three to four minutes and fill that out. Um, we do try to keep it very short. Um, and we also, that's where we get a lot of our ideas for future sessions. So if there's a topic you'd like to see covered that isn't on our um, schedule, um, please let us know um, via that um, evaluation tool that we'll be sending out here in the next uh, next day or so. And it looks like most folks have um, had a chance to um, fill out the evaluation. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, Carrie, one other question came in about, um, a little bit different here, about um, comparing the different um, income-based um, repayment options. Is there a phone number or where, where would you direct people if they want some assistance in comparing the different income-based uh, repayment options? All right, that is a great question. Um, what I typically do is sit down with individuals and we'll either go to studentaid.gov or studentloans.gov. Uh, both of them will link to your 
specific student loans, um, or you can use estimates if you have not taken, you know, if you're not done borrowing yet. Um, and then you put in your actual income, and it will tell you under which plan how much you'll pay. It will break it down to monthly payment. It will break it down to how much interest you're going to pay over the life of the loan. So again, each person is different. Your goal might not be to just minimize your, your monthly payment. You may want to pay it off as quickly as possible, and you may choose a standard repayment plan over the income driven, but it will actually um, give you every single repayment plan and tell you all of these different things. And it's, I think it's wonderful just because um, you get to actually see your, your information and it's not just hypotheticals. Um, another question I see, can a student borrow from direct loans if they're under 12 credits per semester? Direct loans um, are actually for anybody who is over half time. Um, so as an un when I worked in the financial aid office at a land grant university, undergraduate students, that meant they had to take at least six credits to be eligible for loans, um, and graduate students had to take at least five credits. So um, yes, any if you're under full time, you can. Um, just remember, it's going to take you a lot longer to get done with school, which is fine if you're if you're working, but don't take the maximum amount if you're only taking six credits. If you know if you can get ten thousand dollars, you probably don't want to take that for that that few of credits. Um, first time home buyer, can they request documentation from the lender to adjust their home mortgage payment with the USAD or the FSA? No. Um, <laughs> It's it's awful. It's horrible um, for some of these borrowers. Um, you know, I've I've worked with individuals who, would, you know, they're just getting on their feet. They've got a great job. Their their student loan payments are under control. They're out of default. They're ready to buy a house. However, they did take a lot of student loans when they were in school, and unfortunately, it is a federal regulation that they have to use one percent of the outstanding balance. Now, if they're able to pay that down, if they have a good chunk of money and they can pay it down, that 1%, of course, gets lower. So very good question. Documentation does not help because most servicers, you can go on the website and hit a little button that says, I need documentation about how much my, my loan payments are. My suggestion for those individuals is, you know, if they don't um, need to do an FHA or the rural housing development type of loans, um, go and find a lender that will um, not use the 1% if you can. All right. Um, it looks like we've um, got through all of the questions. Um, so with that, um, let me just make a couple quick reminders. It will be uh, November 30th is our next session. See, I think I have that slide there. Um, with Small Steps to Health and Wealth with uh, Dr. Nancy Porter from the University of Idaho Extension will be joining us. Um, so that uh, should be a good session, but again, that will be November 30th. So there will uh, be three weeks until we are back here. So in the meantime, please watch for that evaluation from us. And uh, Carrie Johnson, thank you very much uh, for today's webinar. And uh, we hope that you enjoyed it, and we hope that you will uh, have a great uh, Thanksgiving break here and that we will uh, see you again on November 30th.